night. Been about a month since I've been up here on a Sunday night with Agape Sunday and a couple of guest speakers, but uh, and so it's been a while since we've uh, been engaged in our Sunday night series. And that wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the fact that we just have this one more lesson to go. But we have been studying the final vision recorded in the book of Daniel, uh, depicting what will affect Daniel's people, Israel, describing events uh, in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come, Daniel 10.14 tells us. Its words were to be closed until the time of the end, uh, Daniel 12.9 will tell us. For such reasons, it's been called the vision of the time of the end. In the introductory remarks of the vision, chapter 10, verse 1, through chapter 11, verse 1, there's a glimpse of the spiritual warfare that goes on even today. Then as the vision unfolds, a series of future conflicts involving nations is described. Conflict between the Persians and the Greeks. Uh, Daniel 11, verses 2 and, through 4. And conflict between the kings of the south, Egypt, and the kings of the north, Syria, uh, Daniel 11, 5 through 35, with Israel right smack dab in the middle of it all. Uh, because, well, geographically speaking, they're right smack dab in the middle of it all. Um, beginning with verse 36 of chapter 11, though, there's a large diversity of opinion as to what is being spoken about and, and, and all uh, regarding the identity of the king described and the time in which the events would take place and be fulfilled. As with any difficult portion of Scripture, it's always best to not be dogmatic about our approach and not say, well, we've got it figured out and this is the one and the only way for it to possibly uh, be interpreted. In this study, which is, again, the final one in our series on the book of Daniel, I want to offer what I believe is a plausible explanation of the text. But before we get to the text, though, we, I think we need to discuss, at least briefly, the identity of the king and his times. This will impact the way that we read the, the, the text. And so the first thing you need to understand is, is that there are at least three different views, three primary diff different views. There are others, but, uh, but there are three primary uh, different views. One is that the king is Antiochus Epiphanes of Syria. Now, uh, he is the vile and blasphemous ruler described in verses 21 through 35 of Daniel 11. So it would almost make sense that, that, that they're still talking about him when it comes to verse 36 and following. The time of his persecution then would be 169 to 167 B.C., sometime in there, which was about the time of the Maccabean Revolt in, uh, in Jewish history. This view is espoused by Paul Butler and Albert Barnes. You may notice, recognize the name Albert Barnes. He's the one who wrote Barnes' notes on the New Testament and, and all. But, uh, the second view is that the king represents Roman emperors uh, who persecuted Christians in the early years of the church. So the time of his persecution then would be oh, 60 to 313 A.D., sometime in there. This is the view espoused by Jim McGuigan and other uh, scholarly types. A third different view is that this king represents the Antichrist. Uh, this is a future ruler yet to come. And uh, the time of his persecution will be shortly before the return of Christ. This view is held by premillennialists but also some amillennialists, for example, Edward Young. So of those three, what is the most likely choice? Well, in my humble opinion, we start with the view that the Roman emperors are in view. 
Though certainly the view that it is Antiochus has merit to it. Uh, it, it could be Antiochus. I'm not saying that it couldn't be. Uh, but uh, the view that it is the Antichrist is totally without merit, okay? Uh, you can just sort of scratch that one off your list because th that's not what, it, what, what is being discussed here. Um, but, so it starts at, as the Roman Empire emperors, but then at 12.7, it switches back to Antiochus Epiphanes or to the uh, Barnes and Butler uh, view. Uh, now, you might say, now wait a second, preacher. How can you make it be one thing one moment and then something different the next moment? Well, uh, how I can do this will make more sense as we get there in our study. You know, interpreting prophecy is great like that. I mean, it just, it's, it's a lot of fun like that. There is, now this, this again is not to imply that there is no difficulty with interpreting the passage this way. Just in my way of thinking, it provides the least amount of conflict. Well, now let's consider what is described to come, the events at the time of the end. And we begin with the blasphemy of this king. If we would follow along as I read Daniel 11, verses 36 through 39. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is complete. For what, ha for what has been determined must take place. He will show no rem uh, regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortress, a god unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. Several descriptions are given of the blasphemy of this king. One is he will magnify himself above every god. Um, Lowercase g for God there, just to make sure you understand that. We're not, uh, well, we're not yet talking about God, uh, the real God. Uh, but, uh, saying, but as part of this, though, he will, not only will he say that he is above all other gods, but uh, saying unheard of things against Jehovah God. Okay, he, he, he's going to do that as well. Being successful until the time of wrath is complete. Now, suggesting that this was allowed by God, big G, as part of divine judgment against Israel, uh, as with the case of Assyria and Israel in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 through 12, and, and other times in Israel's history when they were guilty of apostasy and, and God sent a, a foreign power, a foreign nation, uh, to uh, enslave them until they returned and repented uh, before him. He will show no regard for the God of his fathers or for the one desired of women, nor any God. In fact, he, he's, he's going to be, we might say, atheistic. A meaning without or no theistic, talking about God. No God. Uh, but he will do something a little bit different than his forefathers had done, and that is he will honor a God of fortress. A God which his fathers did not know. Some suggest this to be the uh, Roman god Mars or, or Jupiter. And he will attack the mightiest fortresses with this foreign god uh, and rule over many and divide the land for gain. Now if we were to apply this part of the prophecy to the Romans, they were worshipers of mission, military power more than anything else. That was their big deal. That was their God. That's what they valued more than anything else was the military power. That's why Rome came into this whole, into this whole emperor worship thing where they would actually worship their emperors because the emperors were the generals of the army. And, and if they were the generals of the army, they were responsible for the victories of the army. And, and that was what was most important. And so they came to start worshiping their, the, the emperors. 
And those who accepted Roman rule were rewarded. Kind of like we, were, we, we talk about with, uh, with tax collectors. How uh, if you were willing to turn your back on your homeland and on the people in your homeland and collect taxes from the people in your homeland to pay to Rome, then you could pretty much charge whatever you wanted to in taxes. So long as Rome got what they said they wanted to get, the rest was all yours. You were rewarded for your loyalty to the Roman Empire. But it can also be applied to Antiochus. I mean, it, quite honestly, from st what I've studied about Antiochus, uh, this is a fair description of his pride. He, when he was king, when he was ruler, he, he sought only to conquer. Uh, that was his big thing. And the time of wrath and indignation were related to successors in his Greek kingdom. Uh, chapter 8, verse 19. So the blasphemy of this king, he's going to magnify himself above every god. He's going to honor the god of fortress. And we looked at how it could be applied to Romans and how it could be applied to Antiochus. The conquest and end of this king, though, is seen in verses 40 through 45. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle. And the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and, and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of, the, of Ammon, Amnon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans, Nubians, in, in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him. And he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. So the king of the south is going to attack him. Okay, King of the south is still Egypt. Okay, So Egypt attacks, Antioch, or, or attacks this king, the king of the north. And note that it will occur at the time of the end. This may help pinpoint the meaning of the future or latter days spoken about in chapter 10, verse 14. The king of the north will overwhelm the countries. Uh, this is now, uh, could be talking about Rome. He would respond and overwhelm them, entering the beautiful land, Israel, overthrowing many, but Edom... Moab and Ammon will escape. Egypt would not escape, though. Uh, even Libyans and Nubians or the Ethiopians would, will submit. And he will come to his end. Uh, news from the east and north will trouble him. He will extend his power over many countries, planting his tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Perhaps speaking about Mount Zion, where the, the temple was in Jerusalem. Yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. So, king of the south attacks. King of the north responds. It, it just works that way. Now, if we were to apply this to the Romans, it really does make sense. See, Anthony and Mark Anthony and uh, Cleopatra, king of the south, Egypt, Okay, attacked Rome, but they were defeated by Octavian after a vital naval battle. Okay, they wasn't on land, it was on sea, like the ships being spoken of here in Daniel. Uh, with the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, the king of the south was done, was over. Herod pledged to support Oct Octavian, who visited Palestine. When Octavian left for his next conquest, he left his authority in the Holy Land in the person of Herod. That would be Herod who was over the Holy Land at the time of the birth of Jesus. It could also, though, be applied to Antiochus. It's a summation of his wars with Egypt, although it's not known, a fourth attack of, uh, of Antiochus against Egypt was not noted or known in history. It's not 
beyond the realm of possibility that it did take place. He leaves to deal with revolts elsewhere because he hears you know, his kingdom has gotten so spread out it starts to crumble. And he hears of that and so he leaves to deal with it elsewhere. But the Jewish revolt has success under Judas Maccabees who removes the desecration from the temple, who purifies the altar, etc. Antiochus died in 164 B.C. of a terrible disease. Essentially, he went mad. Okay, that, that, That's what happened with him and uh, no one was able to help him with it, which would fit with what Daniel writes here. So, we've got the blasphemy of this king, the conquest and the end of this king. The ultimate victory of Daniel's people. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people everywhere, everyone whose name is not found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes will sleep who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like, with the, like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Notice it is to occur at that time. Uh, chapter 1, to be assisted by Michael, the great prince who protects your people. Also, the archangel Michael, uh, spoken of earlier in uh, Daniel chapter 10, verses 13 and verse 21. In a time of distress never seen before, uh, the deliverance of Daniel's people will happen. And when that does happen, many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, Incidentally, just a little bit of trivia for you here. If someone were to ask you where the only mention of everlasting life is in the Old Testament, that's right here. It's not mentioned anywhere else other than in Daniel chapter uh, 12, verse 2. So uh, many will, will, uh, who sleep in the dust will awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, some people say, well, that, right there he tells us that he's talking about not the end of the Jewish relationship or any of this other stuff. He's talking about the second coming of Christ because those in the grave will, who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Notice what he says, though, is that many, many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. When Jesus returns, all who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. So maybe you know, we need to be very careful about how we apply this and everything, and we'll, we'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. Some will shine at this time. Verse 3, The wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. Those who uh, lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. And then he gives Daniel some sort of, the, the man gives Daniel some strange instruction. Seal up, close up the words of, of these words of these prophecies until the time of the end. Perhaps what is meant is simply to stop writing and secure what he has written. But if you compare that with Daniel chapter 8, verse 17. As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said, understand the vision concerns the time of the end. Now skipping to verse 19 of chapter 8. He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. And then verse 26 the vision of the evenings and mornings has been given to you is true, but seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. Both visions in chapter 8 and in chapters 10 through 12 were to be sealed up. Both pertained to many days in the future, the distant future. 
Yet both visions began to be fulfilled within 200 to 400 years. Now I only say that because there's that other book of prophecy, the one in the New Testament, Revelation. Revelation 22, verse 10 says, Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Daniel's told, Seal up the prophecies, because it concerns a distant future, two to four hundred years into the future. The vision of the revelation was not to be sealed, for the time was near, it was at hand. How then the explanation of some that the events of revelation almost 2,000 years later still have not yet begun? Um, premillennialism is what I'm talking about here. They say that, it, it, that all revelation is yet to be fulfilled, yet... You know, it, it was not to be sealed because its time was at hand. Daniel's was to be sealed because it concerned a distant time only a couple hundred years into the future. Well, anyway, we apply this to the Romans. When Rome had established its authority, Michael keeps a special watch over the Jews. The arch archangel keeps special watch over the Jews until the fall of Jerusalem. Verses 2 through 6 speaks of the rise of a new kingdom. Sort of a symbolic rescue, if you will. Those who accept the Messiah will gain everlasting life. Those who reject the Messiah will receive everlasting contempt. So in that sense, they were brought from the dead of the ways of the law to everlasting life if they accepted Jesus, if they accepted the Messiah. It could also, though, be applied to Antiochus. Uh, using the figure of the re re resurrection, this may depict the Maccabean revolt when the Jews came out of caves and mountain hideouts to resist Antiochus. They came out of the dust of the earth and, and, uh, and, and fought against him, uh, and possibly projection to the re final resurrection of the dead. Well, of course, Daniel's got some questions, doesn't he? So there's some final questions and answers given for Daniel in verses 5 through 13. But uh, the first, let's look at the question overheard by Daniel. He doesn't ask it, he just hears it being asked. Verses 5 through 7. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and the other on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river. How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times, and half a time, when the power of the holy people has been finally, be, been finally broken. All these things will be completed." Daniel sees two others, one on each side of a river bank. Perhaps it's the Tigris River where Daniel was, chapter 10, verse 4. He asked the man clothed in linen, or one of them asked the man clothed in linen, how long before these things are fulfilled? And the answer, a time, times, and half a time. Three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days, commonly used to describe a de definite marked period of tribulation. Uh, as in Daniel 7, verse 25. Uh, also, Revelation 11, 2, verse 3. Revelation 12, 6. Um, and so forth. When the persecution has accomplished its purpose, then these things will take place. Well, Daniel didn't ask a question. His question is found in verses six, uh, 8 through 13. I heard, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time of that daily sacrifice, the daily sacrifice is abolished, and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. 
As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest. And then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Daniel doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. And he's in good company. I mean, this is confusing stuff. Uh, Daniel then asks, what will the outcome of all of this be? And Daniel is told uh, first to go for the words were closed up um, uh, and sealed until the time of the end. Uh, that many will be purified and the wise will understand. That the wicked will continue to be wicked and will not understand. That there will be a period of 1,290 days beginning from the time the daily sacrifice is taken away. The abomination of desolation is set up. And uh, then those who reach in the end of the 1,335 days will be blessed. Daniel's then told to go his way until the end, for he will rest and rise to be his allotted inheritance at the end of the days. Now this end or end of the days may actually refer to the actual resurrection on the day of judgment and not the time of the end spoken of throughout this vision. It's... Uh, the Hebrew is, very, is somewhat different for this. Uh, th this formation of words is different than it has been in the other parts of the vision. <clears throat> so if we apply this to the Romans, this is symbolic of the type of trouble. If uh, three and a half times is the same as in 725, then it's a time of persecution under Rome. A limit though is placed on the oppressor's power. It will only last 1,290 days. Those who outweigh the oppressor and stay faithful will be rewarded. Very possible. But if we apply this part to Antiochus, the time of the sacrifice will not uh, be offered and the temple will be desecrated. Uh, remember, uh, Antiochus did desecrate the temple, but then it was cleansed by Judas Maccabees. Uh, in June of 168 B.C., Antiochus desecrated the temple. He offered pig flesh on the altar of burnt offerings and forbid the Jews to worship God according to the law of Moses. Uh, that was June of 168. But uh, in, on December 25th, 165 B.C., uh, it was cleansed by Judas Maccabees. The same as three and a half times, 1,260 days. But here, 30 days is added to make the exact time, 1,290 days. Um, now, before anyway, you talk about, well, wait, December 25th. Wow, he did that on Christmas. No, this is 168 B or 165 B.C., okay? There's not, December 25th had nothing to do with it. It was just the, the date that, uh, that they were able to cleanse the temple. So that's 1,290 days. Do you know what happened 45 days after that? 45 days after that, Antiochus died. So Antiochus died... 1,335 days after he desecrated the temple. And Daniel here says, Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Kind of a pretty exact prophecy if you stop and think about it. Well, we have seen the vision of the time of the end, Daniel 10 through 12, describes events that would uh, affect Daniel's people, Israel. That it would take place in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. And it will occur in the time of the end. From the context, the time of the end uh, re likely refers to the closing days of God's dealings with Israel as His covenant nation. In other words, the intertestamental period between the days of Malachi and Matthew and the period of time involving the Greek-Persian and Egyptian-Syrian conflicts. Or the time of the establishment of the fifth kingdom. Remember Daniel 2? A fifth kingdom greater than all of them uh, that would never be destroyed, God's kingdom. Uh, or a little bit of both. As we close our study of the book of Daniel, I hope you found it to be a book that strengthens your faith 
in God and His Word through its fulfilled prophecies. Prophecies describing the rise and fall of world empires centuries before they rose and fell. Prophecies foretelling the establishment of God's everlasting kingdom that are seen in Daniel's chapters 2 and 7 and 9. Prophecies depicting the events to befall the people of Israel. Daniel 8 and 9 and then 10 through 12. And inspires faithfulness to God through the examples of dedicated service. The faith and dedication of Daniel, regardless of what it may have potentially cost him. That we saw in Daniel chapter 1 and we see in Daniel chapter 6. The faith and dedication of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. And in Daniel chapter 1 as well. And the incredible value there is in choosing your friends wisely. Choosing friends who are going to help you serve God rather than friends who are going to try to draw you away from serving God. I hope that we learn lessons from people who have gone before us. I hope that we understand that with the the book of Daniel is an exciting book. It's an exciting book with a lot of important messages for us even today. The most important message is that God always wins. God always tells the truth. When God says something's going to happen, then it's going to happen. One thing He has said is that Jesus is going to return. And that when He does return, we need to be ready. Are you ready for Jesus to return? If not, and we can help you to get ready through a public response, won't you let us know by coming to the front as we stand and sing together?